Hey everybody, welcome to this unboxing video. Anyway, no, I'm just kidding. Ryan Miller's literally opening a box that I sent him two years ago. Uh, thank you so much for tuning into this episode. <laughs> We're going to have a great program responding to Todd Friel. You guys stay tuned. It's going to be fun. You are watching The Remnant Radio, a show where we tackle history, theology, and the gifts of the Spirit. My name is Joshua Lewis. I'm the pastor of King's Fellowship in Ada, Oklahoma, together with my friends Michael Miller at Reclamation Church Denver and Michael Roundtree at Bridgeway Church OKC. We set aside time every week to discuss the gifts of the Spirit. Things like, how should we pray for the sick? And how do we interpret tongues? And should we believe all the prophetic words for the new year? If you're looking for a charismatic podcast with practitioners who are actually doing the stuff, this is the show for you. It's been a long time since we've done anything in regards to Todd Friel. In fact, I think I did a response to one of Todd's videos where he's at a restaurant with um, a couple other guys from, I think, MacArthur's ministry. I forget the guy's name that he was with, uh, Phil Johnson, and then another dude. And they were talking about Bethel music, and it was... Anyway, I did a response video. It was so, like... He did. My response was so unbalanced and careful and not very remnant y that I ended up pulling it a long time ago. So uh, we might have to resurface that video and do another response to it. But uh, we're here doing a response to Todd Friel's teaching on tongues and his position on cessationism. Uh, before I dive into all of that, I want to remind you of some of the cool stuff that's coming on here at Remnant while Michael is still unboxing his box there. Um, uh, we're going to be doing a conference in Oklahoma City, September 14th through the 16th. Uh, you should go check out that conference. The links can be found in the description, remnantconferenceswithans.com, remnantconferences. Uh, that is going to be a fantastic conference. We're going to be doing uh, sessions at night, whole group sessions. In the morning, we'll have breakout sessions. I'm going to mute your microphone as you're it's so ridiculous um, as we do uh, uh, breakout sessions in the morning and breakout sessions in the afternoon. Uh, and then we'll do live Q&As and stuff like that as well. Uh, lots of time where we're going to have voices, uh, like I would say prophetic voices. It's such a weird thing to say, such a charismatic thing to say. Uh, people who've been trained up in that gift uh, are going to be practicing in that space as well. So it's going to be a lot of fun. I would really encourage you to sign up as we've only been up for like two weeks and we're almost, I don't want to say almost halfway full, but we're uh, over 200 signups already of only 600 spots. So I would encourage you register while you can uh, because it's coming up pretty soon. It'll be sooner rather than later. Uh, Michael, how are you doing over there in Denver? How, how's that package? It's done, dude. Hopefully I'll stop bugging out with my computer whenever it disconnects from the camera for some reason. Um, I'm good. I had something really cool happen. I can't remember what it was, though. Oh, Got to go camping with my church. That's pretty awesome. And I got to go out to Anaheim and got to meet uh, with Carol, which you I told us. You told us about that last week, week ago. Yeah, you're still still yeah. raving about it. He's still in still the glory raving. of Carol Wimber. He's still basking in it. It's Carol Wong now. She's yeah. she's remarried, but yes, yeah, that was fun. And then uh, yeah, I went camping with my son and the church. And then July Fourth. I mean, we had a lot of fun stuff going on. That's what I love about living and having a church plant in Colorado. You for instead of doing church retreats, you go camping, and that's what we did. It was awesome. Nice. Well, ye yesterday was Fourth of July. Uh, today's my birthday, so we had a couple people from the church come and celebrate the birthday during the lunch hour, and then we, you know, the family got together and shot off some fireworks into the night sky, which was fun. We we have a yard, which is the first time that's ever happened. We've lived in apartments, so we had to set off our own fireworks, which oh, only started fun, a few fires in the backyard uh without further ado do you want to dive into this video do you want to give any kind of yeah. backstory to todd or do what what do we do with this i mean i don't have any backstory i mean i've always found him to be a little bit aggressive uh, in general when it comes to charismaticism um but in this video he's not that aggressive i think he's no. trying to put forward some questions i think he really thinks he's stumping his charismatics so um, no, yeah, he's very patient in this video. I'm, I'm thankful. Uh, Todd has in the past been, like I said, a bit of a provocateur. Um, he's the guy who tossed the question over at John MacArthur. Hey, you know, give me one word response to Beth Moore and give me a one word response to Stephen Furtick. And like, he's kind of known for kind of being a clickbaity shock jock kind of dude. But all that to say, uh, he's he's pretty kind in this video. So it's worth responding to. Do you want to listen to it now? Yeah, let's do it. Cool. You charismatic. Put your gloves down. I do not intend to punch you in the nose. Instead, I want to genuinely, lovingly challenge you to defend your belief that Christians can speak in an ecstatic language that you call 
tongues. Now, after these initial six questions, I'm going to lay out a thesis statement on tongues you just might find compelling. But first, here are some questions for you to ponder. Scripture commands. Tongue speaking requires an interpreter. My question for you is, have you ever seen or heard an interpreter at a gathering when tongue speaking occurred consistently? Gifts are for the edification of the body. So if someone is merely speaking indiscernibly without an interpreter, then you should ask, hmm, is this really biblical? Number two, because spiritual gifts are for the edification of the body, building up of the saints. How does modern day glossolalia edify you as a disciple of Jesus? Be specific. Does it teach you more about the Lord? Does it teach you more about his word or does it leave you with just kind of an odd feeling like, whoa, the spirit, he's really present here. If speaking in tongues isn't interpreted and it cannot edify you cognitively, biblically, maybe it's not biblical. Number three, what's your explanation for other religions that speak in tongues that sound quite similar to the speaking in tongues we hear in Christian circles? I think it's fair to say either those pagans are pretending or Christians are pretending, or even worse, there's a different spirit, not the Holy Spirit, at work in one or both of them? Zoinks? Number four, spiritual gifts are just that. They are gifts. Each Christian is given at least one unique gift upon being saved. So please explain why we have tongue teaching classes and schools to teach a gift. Tongues is either a gift or it's not. It isn't something that you can learn. Number six, thanks for hanging in there. Church history is certainly not on the same level as scripture, but as we look back through church history, we see kind of a spotty history of tongues. The groups that spoke in an ecstatic language, they were inevitably deemed as outside of orthodoxy further. Why did the Lord seem to wait for 2,000 years to make the gifts of tongues such a prominent and prevalent gift? It's worth asking these questions. So here's my challenge for you. Would you be willing to just, just hang in there with me? Let's take someone who speaks in tongues. And if that person spoke in tongues and 10 people with the gift of interpretation wrote down their interpretation of that message, do you have a high level of confidence that they would all match perfectly? If that challenge or any of the preceding six questions perhaps has caused you to question the gift of tongues as we see it practiced so universally these days, might I suggest there's a better explanation for all of the tongue verses. Here's my thesis statement. As the gift of tongues in Acts is clearly a gift of speaking in a foreign language, and as it is difficult to make a biblical case that the gift of foreign languages has definitively ceased, and as Paul was not advocating for speaking in an ecstatic language in 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, but encouraging the careful use of phonetic languages, and as we've heard some credible reports on the mission field of receiving the gift of speaking a foreign language, we can reasonably conclude that while God may give someone the ability to speak in a foreign language that can be understood by a native or one with the gift of interpretation, there never was, nor should be, a gift of ecstatic language that doesn't edify the body. There you have it, my charismatic friend. This is a hotly debated subject. So let's do that. Let's debate this issue. But could we please do it without the hot part? Discuss. I mean, okay, so uh, off off the beginning, like just mm-hmm. just off the cuff here, like again, I want to commend him if he's going to try to reach charismatics and he's actually trying to change their position, reaching them with like kind of patient, calm, like I'm yeah, not, it's the way to do it. not debating, like that's the way to do it, right? So like, yeah, way to go, Todd. I don't like your arguments, but like I actually appreciate the way that you're posturing yourself to engage with Christian brothers and sisters. Like I actually find that pretty commendable. Um, anyway, so any any initial thoughts for you, Miller? No, no, I think that's exactly what we try to do is we want to, if we disagree with somebody, we want to put out the best arguments that we've got and let them respond. And hopefully they will. And we've done that a, a few different times. I mean, when we talked about is open but cautious actually biblical and we put out some you know, some feelers for our open but cautious crowd. And hopefully we'll get some of them responding and or they'll change their position on it, which I think is exactly what Todd's trying to do here in this video. He's trying to get us to think thoughtfully, carefully about uh, certain charismatic practices, the main one being tongues. So I, yeah. I can commend him for that. Yeah. Okay, cool. So uh, first argument, uh, tongue speech requires interpreter, which isn't a question. But then he says, uh, do you have a tongue interpreter interpreting consistently? I made the argumentation that this is for the gifts of the spirit or for edification. So that was his primary argument. Argument number one, if you're going to have the gift of tongues, you need to have an interpreter and you need to be able to do it regularly. How would you respond to that, Michael? Okay. So, I mean, th- there's a premise here, though, that needs to be questioned. I, I question the premise. Tongue speech requires an interpreter. I don't know if that says that in scripture. I know that it says in a public meeting where there are unbelievers or people uninformed about gifts that it requires an interpreter 
but it's not saying in all cases and circumstances, interpretation is required. Uh, but then you can also see that Paul, his goal is that everybody there in the meeting would be benefited by whatever is uh, being spoken. And so it makes sense. Like this is meant to be for the whole group. Therefore, the whole group should understand what you're saying. Like what is what good is it for us to, to speak to a group without them actually understanding what we're saying? So I'm 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 there on some of that, but I, I question that all tongue speaks requires an interpreter in all circumstances. The yeah, only and- passage we have is out of First Corinthians 14, and in that it is talking contextually. About yeah, I would group. say the verse that I would point to is verse 18, right? He says, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Nevertheless, in church, I would rather speak five words with my mind uh, in order to instruct others than 10,000s in tongues. So it seems as if Paul is saying, I speak in tongues more than all of you, but in my local assembly, I try to speak in known languages, right? Like ones that are comprehensible. So it, it almost appears in 1 Corinthians 14, 18, that Paul himself is saying, that he exercises the one gift of tongues in his own prayer life. That's not in the local assembly. So, and this is a, a nuanced difference between our position on the gift of tongues, more of an evangelical position on tongues than the like classical Pentecostal uh, space. A lot of uh, the charismatic movement, usually in the more Pentecostal veins, will say that the gift of tongues, there's two different gift of tongues, one that's a personal private prayer language and one that's a known uh, language or a language, a spiritual language that, that requires an interpreter, some kind of teaching uh, of tongues. We we would say that there's one gift of tongues, um, and that that one gift, you know, can be different languages, whether they be known or spiritual languages. Um, but that that um, that there's one gift of tongues that operates in a personal, private way and in a public way. Um, but that there aren't two separate gifts, neither here nor there. This is a bit of semantics, well, but it does appear that Paul is saying he prays in tongues more than everybody. Yeah. And so he, he, I think the verse he's actually using about, you know, not speaking in tongues, it's from first Corinthians 14, 28 says, but if there is no interpreter, he should be silent in the church. Let him speak to himself and to God. So the idea though, is that he actually should speak in tongues, but he should do it in such a way that not everybody's hearing it. Um, that it should be between him and God, not necessarily out in the open so that everybody can hear what he's saying. And I, you know, I, I think we do see, I mean, to be fair to Todd, there are a lot of charismatic churches that they showed videos of where they're speaking in tongues and big meetings where they don't know the people around them. There could be unbelievers, people uninformed about gifts, and there doesn't seem to be any interpretation. So he's criticizing a practice that's actually happening Correct. quite a lot, right? Yeah, and, and we um, would actually agree with Todd that yeah. tongues publicly without interpretation is wrong. It's, in, it's indecent and it's out of order. And if you're going to have a gift of tongues being used, there needs to be an interpreter present, right? Well, unless it's just you and I, Josh. Right. Unless if, it's a small group of where you know everybody in the room is both informed and are believers. Yep. But if there's unbelievers or people uninformed about gifts, we're told that it actually functions as a sign of judgment. They'll think you're mad. They'll think you're a barbarian. You know, he quotes Isaiah 28, 11 in that passage saying it functions as a sign of judgment whenever there's not interpretation and people who are uninformed or unbelievers are in the room. So I, I get what he's after. I just disagree with the premise to begin with that all tongue speech requires interpretation. Um, but the other thing he says is, uh, do you have a tongues interpreter interpreting consistently? What would you have to say about that, Josh? Um, I mean, it's an interesting question. Um, it appears that you would need to know, and this is one of the things about the gift of tongues, and this is where me and Todd actually will significantly disagree because I understand the gift of interpretation to take place in a spiritual way. So the the assumption, uh, the assumption again, is that these are all known human languages. He says that in his video. He believes tongues are always known human languages, which of course you wouldn't need a spiritual gift of interpretation for a known human language. You would just have to know that language. So if you are a Spanish speech speaker and I'm speaking in tongues, a language that I don't understand, but I happen to be speaking in Spanish, a language that you do understand, you actually don't need a gift or an empowerment of the Holy Spirit to interpret that tongue. Um, so he mentioned stories that he believes are credible of people overseas speaking in tongues and unbelievers uh, who know that native language understanding what's being said. But that's not a spiritual gift of interpretation. That's just a natural gift of comprehension. Right. So a spiritual gift of interpretation would somehow someone speaking in tongues and then another person supernaturally comprehending what's being said.
but that would presuppose that you're practicing the gift of tongues with a group of believers or else you'll never know if anyone has an interpretation. Like, how do you know that someone in the first century had a supernatural gift of interpretation unless they got around other people who were speaking in tongues? So the the question, the, the answer kind of begs the question, uh, you would need to have a kind of context where people were speaking in tongues in order for you to know if there was a gift of interpretation. So again, you would have to have those correct spaces, those correct boundaries and borders. Uh, but of the people that I know who have interpreted tongues, um, I don't know that they are always gifted with that gift any more than the people that I know that have the gift of prophecy uh, stand up and can on command prophesy like Elijah in the Bible. You know, uh, they ask for a prophetic word. He doesn't give them one and he asks for a minstrel to come. And then the spirit of the Lord comes upon him, right? Because men don't prophesy by their own will. They're carried along by the spirit of God when they prophesy. I think the same thing is said of interpretation. The spirit gives those as he wills. So if someone's speaking in tongues and you have an interpreter who's present, like he might get the interpretation, but someone else in the body might get the interpretation as well. But you would have to give it to those who are typically frequented with that gift. Is that is that helpful at all, Michael? Yeah, I think so. And that's been in my experience. Uh, so my wife, uh, she has done that multiple occasions. She's understood, but she doesn't always understand. And she doesn't always understand everybody who, ever, who she's ever heard. And that's been what I've seen with people across the board. Uh, another person who does this, do you remember David Hayes over at Wellspring? Oh, yeah. I know David. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, David was probably 13 years old, and he asked the, uh, me to pray for him that God would give him that gift. And so we did, and he literally was able to interpret. Now, get this. I'm going to tell you what the interpretation was so you can just kind of see, like, this is not something someone could just make up. Um, the state, So I spoke in tongues. He then interpreted, and he heard me saying, uh, I walked across the ocean. Or sorry, I walked across the sea. You will walk across oceans. I fed the 5,000. You will feed the nations. Uh, and it was a few other things. That's just what I remember. And this was like, I don't know, 20 years ago. That's pretty amazing, don't you think? And and as a 13-year-old, I, I don't think he just make that up, right? Certainly. It's pretty profound. Yeah. And so, uh, but again, even him who had such a profound interpretation doesn't always happen. But then there's been also been other occasions without the gift of interpretation where both you and I have had this experience where somebody has understood what we said in their own native language. It wasn't a spiritual gift of interpretation. It was just them understanding the language. And so, so like in Acts 2, they get up and they spoke in what we perceive to be known human languages and Parthians and Medes and people from Cappadocia and Mesopotamia, like all these different groups, geographical uh, regions could hear them speaking in their known tongue. And that's not a spiritual gift of interpretation because the spiritual gifts are given to believers, not to unbelievers. Or at right. least that's how we understand it. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I would, I, I could make the argument that, that God can give even unbelievers gifts. Um, but I don't know. That'd be shaky ground. But either way, yeah. I'm with you. No, on that. I mean, I, I mean, you've got the kings of the Old Testament who have dreams, and then the prophets of the Old Testament interpreting those dreams. So I could, I could see it. But I think the normative expression that we see in the New Testament is the right. Spirit gives gifts to the body. So I think right. it's yeah. Uh, there, there is scholars like J. Michael, no J. Robin Williams, not can, to be confused with the comedian Robin Williams, but J. Robin Williams. Uh, he, uh, he pontificated that the interpretation was the gift rather than the tongue being the gift that they spoke yeah. in static speech and that everyone around heard them speaking that was the miracle um but but this to say that like we had a, a gathering do you know brock bingman at all uh yeah, yeah. michael so yeah brock came to our church and we had him come in and do a training and it was on prophecy and we did that whole thing but he felt led i think he felt led he ended up doing it um where one person who had the gift of tongues spoke in tongues and we had a group of people around ask God for an interpretation. Now, we were all believers. There was no unbeliever in the room. Everyone had been educated and trained on what this gift is. So it wasn't like, you know, complete organized chaos. And there were three different, okay, let's write it down. Let's, you know, ask God, you know, what this means. Or the people who felt like they got an interpretation wrote it down. And what was odd about it was it did feel like there were, there was this, th this person was saying this thing about water and this person over here was saying this about God's, you know, new birthing of this other thing. And it, it seemed kind of a little scattered. And then someone said, well, I heard Isaiah 35 and we flipped to that passage and, and all of those things were, were in that passage. Right it was a really, yeah. it was a really cool experience for everyone because they thought, okay, well, maybe we don't have the gift of interpretation. And then that one connective piece of tissue kind of pulled it all together, which was a neat thing for them. Um, so I've, for, had a, I've had, go ahead, go ahead. sorry. 
No, no, please. Well, as I say, I've had experiences where we've had people interpret, and I had several people all interpret together. Uh, so they all wrote down their interpretation. That way, you, nothing could be contrived. Everybody's just writing it down, and then they're all presenting. And we have seen a lot of people get the very same kind of messages. I think the the standard I would question is, um, I, from him, it sounds like it has to be uh, one-to-one interpretation as opposed to um, – uh, all of us getting the same general message. Uh, so like, for instance, if you heard me and in, uh, interpreted me speaking in tongues and I was talking to you about the gold that God wanted to give you and another person t- heard me talking of, in tongues about the finances God wanted to give you and somebody else heard a blessing that God wanted to give you, you and I would go, yeah, it sounds like everybody's getting the same interpretation. Uh, but for Todd, I think his standard might be a little bit different. He's going to expect it to be the exact same words. Yeah, it seems probably that his, uh, I would imagine, and I don't want to speak for Todd here, but it, it probably would be that of prophecy as well. Uh, I think that the assumption is that if God is speaking, that it is impossible to um, hear anything different than other. Hear anything different. So we thing. would take yeah. it as the revelation is coming from God, but it's the interpretation and application of man. Like the same, like this scripture is inspired, inerrant, infallible, but it's my interpretation and application of this inerrant inspired word that can err. So I think we would say the same thing about tongues is that the gift of, of speech that God is speaking through a person, if I don't say is infallible, but it's God praying through us, but it's our human words partnered with the interpretation of that, that is corrupted, potentially fallible, that, you know, not perfect. Um, and I think that you can parse those things together. I think the same way that if I had three people that listened to Miller's sermon, I could say, hey, what did he talk about? And they might all say, hey, this passage in Leviticus, but they might all walk away with different points of that sermon when trying to articulate right. what it is. Um, when that's, I wouldn't have we, a problem We have with scriptural that. precedent for that very thing. When Jesus prays the words, Father, glorify your name in heaven, uh, some people say, you know, obviously, and it says the, the Father speaks. He says, yeah, I have glorified it. I will glorify it again. Well, you've got some people, the voice of God. Some people say a voice of an angel. Some people only heard it thunder. So the question is, did God do all three of those things? Or uh, did he do all three of those things and everybody just didn't hear the same thing or they're interpreting it differently? I mean, there's a number of things there that could have us going, okay, God clearly did spoke because the scriptures say very explicitly God spoke. But what people interpreted, what people heard is often very different. And I'd, I'd say the same thing could be true with tongues. So, okay, so point number one, I need to pull my, I pull my Bible over in my computer in front of me so that I can make sure I pull up his points correctly. Sure. So point number one, he was saying, hey, you need an interpreter and they have to be able to interpret consistently. Now, mm-hmm. I would agree that we wouldn't know if someone has a gift of interpretation unless they were doing it somewhat frequently, but that's not mm-hmm. to say that they could do it infallibly. So like, I think there are people I know who have the gift of healing in that when they pray for people, oftentimes people get healed. But that's not to say that they right. exercise that gift on command whenever they want, just like Paul, and we go through this all the time on, on the show, left Trophimus at Melita sick, Epaphroditus on his deathbed, Timothy had some wine for his stomach, Galatia, the very first book he wrote, he had some kind of infirmity. So even Paul, who had the gift of healing, I would say, wasn't able to operate on command with that. So I think that there is a there is an assumption that if you have the gift of tongue interpretation, that you should be able to do that on command consistently. And I don't think that he has a biblical verse for that. I think that is an assumption. Uh, it's, it's, it's imposed on the text. Supposed yeah. that he's he's tossing on it, but he's at least being internally consistent with his logic. So, like, I, I don't want to fault him. I just don't. I don't. I think that he's kind of being reductionistic with the way that the gift of interpretation works. I agree. Cool. Yeah. So, point Let's number two. The next point. Yep. Uh, if tongues is for edification, how does tongues edify you? As a disciple of Jesus, be specific. Does it teach you more about the Lord? Does it teach you more about His Word? Uh, or does it leave you with an odd feeling of how the Spirit is really present here? Uh, anyway, what are your thoughts there? Well, I think his his already, like there's some underlying uh, layers to this that he's already kind of putting in the question that, again, is presuppositional. Uh, he's He's saying, how does it edify you? And then he defines what edification has to look like based upon his eisegetical approach. It has to look like cognitive edification, right? It has to somehow teach you something that you didn't know. And I would actually say, I don't know if that's what that's for. Um, I actually think the scriptures are what we need to teach us. Um, and that, that that's what's good for edification. So if it's, if it's reaffirming the scriptures, cool. 
but I would also say he's limiting all that is encompassed with edification. So like edif edify just means to build up. So if it's actually causing you to, I don't know, have more faith. I uh, think about this, like um, if you know that God would answer your prayers, would you pray more? Probably, right? So if there's an interpretation where God is telling you, hey, you prayed this, or here's the the prayer that's in your heart, and they interpreted that very thing, guess that, what that's probably going to make you do more? It's going to make you pray. Um, so I, I, again, I think he's he's limiting what edification looks like to be purely cognitive and not necessarily other things as well. I mean, he mentions like, what if it's just, you know, you getting a gooey feeling of, wow, the spirit is present here. Well, why would that be a bad thing? Why not that be a good thing? Wouldn't that cause you to pursue God and be like, wow, he's here. I'm going to pray more. I'm going to ask for more. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to try to hear him and listen to him. Like those things are good things. So, and, and I think they fit within that framework of edification. So I, I, I don't know. Am I misinterpreting what he's saying, Josh? No, do I don't think so. Way? But I think he also sets a goalpost for what tongues is supposed to do that the scriptures don't set. So like Paul says, therefore, the one who speaks in tongues should pray that he interpret. For if I pray in a tongue... My spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful, right? So like Todd is sitting here saying, well, if you speak in tongues, it should be able to edify your mind. Paul literally says tongues is not fruitful to my mind. Like it actually, it edifies the, the rest of the community, like when I speak in tongues. So, so Paul is saying that the personal use of this gift doesn't necessarily edify my mind. But here you're saying like, what, what does it benefit? But he's saying it, it has to. I know he's saying it has to, but, but Paul says it doesn't. So I, I just, right, exactly. I think that Paul's standard is objective. Whereas though Todd's makes sense logically, um, I think that it's not taking account for what the scriptures are saying when he says that when he speaks in a tongue, his mind is unfruitful, right? The only way that that gift is going to edify the community is if people understand what is being prayed. But that's not to say that your prayers don't do something. So let me ask a question. Like if I pray for the church and, and you know, you know which church I'm going to pray for? It's the one in Papua New Guinea, right? It's the one that I'm always talking about, right? So like I'm praying for the church in Papua New Guinea, right? Um, and I'm speaking, I'm praying in English, is the church over there edified and encouraged by it? Well, probably like, like probably not mentally, like probably not cognitively, but are my prayers doing something if I'm praying in English? Sh sure. Right. Like God hears my prayers. Like those, those prayers are, are doing something or else we wouldn't be called to pray. So if I'm praying in tongues and I don't know what to pray, but my prayers are going vertical, they're doing something. So even if I don't understand my prayers, I mean, Romans talks about prayers that are unutterable, but we make in groans. Like just because I don't quite understand like what I'm trying to pray, the spirit can still pray through you to accomplish his will in the earth. So, um, I mean, not to get weird with this stuff, but I, I've had friends who've prayed over people who were demonized, didn't know what to do, didn't know what to pray. But when they spoke in tongues, there was a removal of said demonic force because the spirit is praying through they don't know how to pray like i don't know how to take care of this issue but i'm i'm going to speak in tongues in this moment and they saw breakthrough take place because of it so uh, again i think that there's an assumption that meaningful christian ministry has to take place in the mind um i, I don't i don't want to say that that's kind of gnostic but like it is it's it, it's not just knowledge that we're going after like there is a comfort, there's a nearness, there's a relationship. Like it's it's kind of a holistic thing. It doesn't have to just take place in the mind. I, I don't know. Yeah, there's a uh, comment in the comment section I just want to touch on. And this is okay. from Eternal Investments. He says, the narcissist edifies self. So I would say, then why does Jude 20 literally say, brothers, edify yourself in the most holy, in the Holy Spirit? He says, by praying in the Holy Spirit, he's quite literally commanding them to edify themselves. So is Paul or Jude, whoever's writing that letter, is he telling them to be narcissistic? I don't think so. No. Again, I think I think your presupposition, and you also mentioned in there that unfruitful mind is for the one who hears my understanding, or sorry, that, that wasn't the one you were, the comment. You were saying that he must understand what he's saying, and that's why it's edifying. And then you put a little duh in there. But Paul flat out says, when I pray in a tongue, my mind is fruitless. So what will I do? Well, I'll pray with my tongue and I'll pray with my mind. He does both interchangeably. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, the, 
there, there's no sense in the text that he actually knows what he's saying when he prays in tongues every single time. If anything, it says just the opposite. Correct. I would I would disagree with that pretty strongly. Yeah. Can can we say though, uh, because some people are listening to this and they heard you make Jude twenty about tongues. Um, you're well, no, I didn't that say that about tongues. Command. I, I right, made that right, about right. edification. I didn't say tongues. Right. It says right. edify yourself, uh, praying in the Holy Spirit. And I didn't say that that means tongues only. I just said right. prayer. Yep. And I want to make that clarification because some people will make a mountain out of a molehill there and say that's what you were saying. That's not what he was nope. saying because we we've cited not this on the show over and over again. You know, praying in the Spirit is praying in faith. It's not necessarily uh, praying in the an language unknown prayer. language. Whereas right. we would believe that praying in an unknown language is praying in the spirit, but it's not It's not exclusively what Jude's talking about there. The, the connection that Michael's making is if we're told to build up ourselves in Jude, there's nothing wrong with building ourselves up. It's in certainly first, not first narcissistic. Kingdom. Correct. Right. Yeah, right. there's no way that that's narcissistic. That's like, um, like, stop reading your Bible. It might edify you, you narcissist. Um, like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like that's not that's not the way that we approach these, like, like personal growth in the Lord, reading our Bible, praying, worshiping, like we we do these things and they certainly build us. I, I'm i super edified when I worship. I'm super edified when, you know, I'm teaching one another in Psalms, hymns and spiritual songs and I'm I'm, I'm praying and I'm worshiping God and I'm, I'm praying in the spirit or prophesying and like find out that, man, that was actually a word from the Lord or see a demon cast out of someone like, wow, look, like, you know, my, my wife called me today with a migraine and we prayed over her and her migraine left like, that was super encouraging to me. Like, is there like some kind of cerebral lesson that I'm learning? No, I'm just like trusting in the power of God and seeing God work, like move on our behalf. Like that's a, that's an encouraging thing. I don't have like some kind of life lesson though, or some kind of like biblical text that gets exegeted because someone got healed. Um, that's not always, that's not always the end goal. I don't think. Um, right. Anyway, you want to hit the next point? Sure. Yeah. It says, what is your explanation for other religions who speak an ecstatic speech that sounds similar to modern tongues? So are pagans pretending? Are Christians pretending? Even worse, there is a different spirit causing both reactions. Um, what do you think, Josh? Well, what do you so, do with other religions that speak in tongues? And it sounds right. similar to Christians who or quote unquote Christians who speak in tongues. There's a lot of practices that pagans do that look like Christian practices. Like Muslims kneel when they pray. I've seen Christians kneel when they pray. Should Christians stop kneeling when they pray? I see Muslims, you know, uh, fast. Should Christians not fast, right? Like I see, you know, Mormons giving money to the poor. Should Christians not give money to the poor? The, the assumption is that because it looks the same, it must be the same. But the Bible talks about tongues. The Bible says that if I, the man who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men, but to God, right? You're praying upward. Like you're asking God for, and it says the man doesn't comprehend him. And you have to pray for a spiritual gift of interpretation so that you can understand what you're praying. So, so again, like the Bible is saying that there is a language that is unknown to the speaker. He doesn't know whether it's a known human language. He doesn't know if it's gibberish. He doesn't know if it's some kind of like supernatural language. I mean, the thought rose into my head and, and Miller, you can, you can shout me down on this if you think this is garbage, but like the idea that every tongue and every nation will worship Jesus, like they will bow, they will confess. And the thought that like there are nations, tribes of people that Attila the Hun wiped out that never got to know about Yahweh, that never got to know about Jesus. And the idea that today we could potentially be speaking in a language that is a known human language, but a language of a people that's long lost to human history. Like that's a fantastic idea. And I'm not saying that's what the Bible is saying tongues are, but like we needed the Rosetta Stone to figure out what certain languages were. They were lost to history. So this idea that we can like analyze some kind of tongue speech and know that it is some kind of language or not a language. Like I just, I don't know that you can infallibly know that. Like maybe there is a dialect that that has been lost to human history. That when people are speaking in tongues, they're they're speaking in some lost language. So we, I just don't think we can know. Um, well, yeah, his, his assumption is that the ecstatic speech of those tongue, charismatic tongue talkers is exactly what he says it is. It's just gibberish, it's ecstatic. It's not necessarily a known language. You don't know that. Yeah. There could be any number of sp speeches out there and tongues out there that you have no idea. And that people are like, well, put it into Google Translate. It'll figure it out. I'm like, maybe. Uh, does Google Translate know every language that's ever existed throughout all human history? No, it doesn't. And so therefore, Google Translate is not going to be your definitive answer on whether or not the language a person is using is actually a known language somewhere on the earth or somewhere in history. Yeah, and also the the oracles of Delphi in the first century were practicing false tongues. 
So, like, let's not pretend that the Kundalini spirit is like a new kind of demon. And because this looks like this, then they must be the same thing. Why can't you say that of the first century? That the tongues. Well, you in could say that about Moses. Corinth. Yeah, the, or the Church of Corinth and and the the uh, the the ministry of the Oracle of Delphi. They're the same thing. Therefore, they're not. It's not the Holy Spirit. Like I just, you can't make a because it's similar. It is the same thing. What were you saying about well, Moses? I, well, I was saying uh, Moses performed some signs. Guess what? The magicians under Pharaoh were also able to perform similar signs. Right? They both turned their staffs into snakes. So, oh, should we assume that because Moses turned his staff into a snake, and so were the magicians, that therefore what Moses did was actually not the Spirit of God working through Moses? or something godly at all it just doesn't one does this in this case one plus one doesn't equal two here this is not a one-to-one -one correlation it looks like a duck it quacks like a duck but when you got closer you actually found out it was a goose so yeah uh, it's, it's an not, ugly duck not, not, it's an ugly duck uh <laughs> okay do we do we have that one pretty well nailed down like is there any more to be said on that like the idea that it looks similar therefore it has to be the same thing i think is silly yeah, I, yeah, I, I think like we're doing that. Not good. Okay, cool. Uh, number four, spiritual gifts are. I'm sorry, spiritual gifts are gifts. Uh, each Christian is given at least one spiritual gift when they get saved. Again, not a question. And then he says, "So please tell me uh, why we have tongues teaching classes that teach spiritual gifts." Now, Michael, you've done some tongue teaching classes. Tell me about your tongue teaching <laughs> classes. What do you What do you do in your tongue teaching classes, Michael? I have done a class on tongues. Matter of fact, at the Remnant Radio Conference, I will be doing another class on tongues. In that, I'm not going to be telling people how to teach how, or how to speak in tongues. I can't do that. I'm with him on this. It is a gift of the Spirit. So either the Spirit gives you that gift or he doesn't. However, I am going to teach the biblical concepts uh, on tongues and interpretation, all of which largely is going to come from Acts chapter 2 and from 1 Corinthians 14, because that's the most information we have on those particular gifts. Um, how, so in this sense, I, I kind of agree with him here, because what he's referencing are people, and he you know, shows all the YouTube videos of how to talk in tongues. And, and we know this and uh, from Pentecostal circles that we've been in. You know, someone will say, hey, just repeat after me. Should have bought a Hyundai, bought a bought a Kia, you know, like, and then once they say that, then they suddenly got the gift. So you did it. Uh, that's not how it works. And so I'm with him in that. There are some pretty bad practices in the charismatic world that both Josh and I and Michael Roundtree on the Remnant would disagree with. Um, but that said, you should be teaching on the gifts, what the gifts are and how they operate. And there's actually plenty of scriptural evidence for them. And yes, you can share your stories and anecdotal evidence that supports it. So that's what we will be doing at the Remnant Radio Conference, or at least one of the breakout sessions. Yeah, so so when we, we talk about uh, the gift, we're oftentimes, like when we do uh, lessons on prophecy and how to, how to hear God or whatever, what we'll do is we'll describe the ways that God speaks in the Bible. God speaks in dreams. God, God speaks through visions. God speaks through voice, right? Like there are different ways that God speaks in the Bible, and we'll <laughs> teach those things. You're clearly reading comments that you think are hilarious. I, Matthew uh, Nelson's comment was pretty funny. <laughs> Okay, I will. I will find it, Matthew Nelson. You, you got me chuckling. <laughs> you gonna make me read it? Yeah, absolutely. I haven't read it yet. <laughs> you place a stick in their mouth. Then it struck them. Just spell out the words while biting the stick. Then you will know that they're filled with the spirit. <laughs> so stupid. Okay. I don't know why. I that's I, funny. I, I I got to you when when we were live. Okay, so um, <laughs> sorry. No, no, it's okay. So we're, we're teaching like, hey, these are the different ways that God speaks in the Bible. We're going to create boundaries and borders to say, okay, if this violates Orthodox Christian teaching and practice, like we're looking for revelation on, on personal life, you know, uh, direction, or we're asking God to reveal something, but we're not looking to institute a new Christian doctrine. We're not, we're not asking it to violate existing Christian doctrine. We're, we're holding to what, what is written in 1 Corinthians 4, 6, not to go beyond what was written, uh, and that those who are spiritual should submit themselves to the kind of testing and discerning of these prophetic words in accordance with 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 19 through 22. So like we're, we're setting up theological guardrails that keep this thing on the tracks, if you will. So when we are teaching this, we're not saying, if you come to me, I will impart the gift of prophecy to you and you will be able to prophesy. No, no, no. We're going to tell you how this thing works and then we're going to ask God to speak to us and then we're going to see if that gift is given. Like no one's going to know if God's speaking to them until they test it. Uh, what's that passage in Jeremiah where Jeremiah was told to go out and buy a field and once he redeemed the field, then he knew it was the Lord. 
You know what, Pat? I, I know you've got that one probably up, memorized, bro. don't you? No, I think you just made it up, man. Ah, oh, come on, dude. I don't even think don't it's do in there. Uh, gosh, what is it? Um, is it Jeremiah 32? I think you might be right. It says, Where's my country when you need him, dude? This dude's on vacation. Purchase it. Here, let me look it up. I can get it really quickly. I think yeah, it's Jeremiah got, he's, 32. He's our Bible Rolodex. Like, we don't even have to, like, have Google next to us when Roundry's here. He's just like, oh, it's this verse. Um, so I, uh, I would say that, like, we're we are creating guardrails, and then we're asking God to speak to us. And I think the same yeah, thing happens with the gift of tongues. It's Jeremiah 32, 6 through 8. So yeah, the Lord tells him to go and buy this field. He has a right of redemption to purchase it. Then he runs into his cousin who tells him to do exactly what the word of the Lord said. And then after he does what the Lord says, he says this, then I knew it was the Lord. So he knew after the fact. And that's kind of what happens when we practice prophecy. We usually know after the fact when it's the Lord. That's right. Always, so when it, when it comes to these uh, things, when it comes to it, teaching on tongues, do we agree with Todd that there are people who are teaching tongues in a way that's both unbiblical and unhelpful? Yes. Yes. Do we agree with Todd that there are people out there who are practicing tongues in public settings where unbelievers or unlearned people are, are present and it's not edifying anyone and that person should remain silent? Yes. Yes. Um, so so I, the, what's difficult about this video is we actually agree with the inspiration and the thrust of what like Todd is trying to address. We just think he's coming to wrong conclusions. Like, do I do I think there are false tongues out there from false religions? Hundred percent. But do I believe that confessing Christians who and this is the question um, ask God for a good gift that He gives them a serpent or a demon? You know, or do do I believe that if we ask God for the Holy Spirit, He gives good gifts to those who ask Him? I, I think the latter is true. I don't think Christians in the charismatic movement are demonized because they're praying to the Father in the name of Jesus, asking for a spiritual gift. They're somehow being infused and empowered by a false spirit. I just, I, I don't accept that. The Bible suggests that that's not what God does. So um, anyway, uh, I think that's a ridiculous claim. Uh, what, what's your what's your uh, last point in there, Miller? Do you see another point? Mm, oh, tongues can't be no. learned. That's five. We agree with that one, but it was in point four, basically. Point six. Yeah. Okay. Church history says tongue speakers were outside of orthodoxy. Why? Why? I mean, does it? Really? Why did the Lord hide away the gift for over 2,000 years? So he's making a pretty large assumption that the gift disappeared for 2,000 years, first off, which we know both from the early church fathers and from several Ain't historian true. books that that's not the case, right. uh, which we've made that case before. Uh, but then also he says that church history says tongue speakers were outside of orthodoxy. Where? And I'm sure that there are non-Christians who have tongues, that I'm pretty sure Todd is referring to his church community has decided that people who speak in tongues are outside of orthodoxy. And he's probably pointing to maybe the oneness Pentecostals that came out of Azusa, which we would agree. Yeah, that's outside of orthodoxy. The idea that there is um, not three persons in the one divine being called God, uh, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, but that there is one God with one person manifesting in three different ways. We would agree that that is heresy. And those people do speak in tongues. Um, but we would say that that is not Christian orthodoxy. And we would actually agree with Todd on that. But the idea that that, that is the normative expression is not the case. Like the classical Pentecostals have a orthodox, robust Christology. They believe in the Trinity. Uh, they have like Chalcedonian definitions. Like they would hold to uh, the Nicene Creed. Like they, they hold to we. historic Christian faith. So the idea that just because some people have spoken in tongues, you know, in the early 1900s, therefore all of them who spoke in tongues were some kind of some kind of false religion, um, that's that can't be the case. Um, you know, with the Moravians, um, with throughout the church history, early church fathers, you know, we do see a lot of the gifts, if you will, I'm using air quotes here, die out. And that's not entirely true. You always see them present somewhere. Heck, Todd says he's seen the gift of tongues from credible reports from missionaries. Even Todd believes the gift of tongues is still around. He just doesn't think it, he's just not comfortable with it in corporate settings. So I don't think that just because this gift um, at some times wasn't being pursued and wasn't being practiced, therefore God removed that gift entirely. Um, I don't I don't think that's a healthy expectation or expression of spiritual gifts. Um, the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 14, earnestly, you know, pursue love. I'm sorry, pursue love and earnestly desire spiritual gifts for 1 Corinthians 14, 1, especially that you prophesy. So it says, desire, pursue, zelo, zelo, zeluo is the Greek word, to lust after, to want spiritual gifts. And I think that um, throughout the 
modernization of Christianity in the West, um, that as it became more of a job of the priest and the distance between the piety and the laity, they weren't being encouraged to pursue any kind of spiritual gift or office or anything of the above, but that, that became a kind of professional priest sort of uh, occupation. Additionally, with the continual evangelization of pagan religions and pagan uh, pagan practices and the kind of witchcraft that began to come into the church, there was again a distinction of like, hey, we're just going to let the priests do this because they know how to do this and they have the guidelines and the rules. Uh, heck, even during the Protestant Reformation, granted, granted, super Protestant, totally believe they were fabricated miracles, totally think they were fabricated stories and relics and wild things that were taking place in uh, the, the, during the Protestant Reformation. Uh, however, uh, the Roman Catholic Church is appealing to the ability to cast out demons and heal the sick as part of their argument. That's the reason that John Calvin and B.B. Warfield and Middleton pushed so hardly against the gifts of the Spirit was because of Rome's practice of them. So this idea that like, well, the gifts died off, well, that, that's, that can't be a thing because all the way through history, they're appealing to these gifts when talking to heretics. Like, by what spirit are you casting out these demons? By what spirit are you, you know, healing the sick? Like, we believe in the Orthodox Christian faith because we're seeing the power of God manifest in our midst. So I don't think it's a good argument to say that tongues, you know, we know that it ceased because all of these groups are heretical. Just because your group says they're heretical doesn't make them heretical. I just, I don't think that's a fair well, biblical response. I think there's another thing here is one, I actually don't think the gifts of the spirit ceased. Uh, I mean, in history, that we have no record of them. In fact, I would say it's not Azusa Street, which is the only example he gives of when it reappears, you know, 2,000 years later. Uh, we actually have examples of this in the Protestant Reformation. Go pick up your uh, pick up a copy of the Scots Worthies written by John Howey in 1781. He has accounts of resuscitations for the dead, people giving accurate prophetic words. Uh, a guy named George Wishart was giving accurate prophetic words and people speaking in tongues. I just don't know where he's getting this from. And th there's other examples. That's just that's just one later uh, during the Reformation where this uh, doctrine of cessationism was birthed. So I always like to point to that Scottish Reformation because in the midst of the Reformation, when Ke when cessationism was being birthed by Calvin, you have this group of Presbyterian prophets over there in Scotland that are actually seeing all of these gifts be present and active. So, But to be fair, um, he's, he's he saying that there's a cessation of the gifts, Miller, because he's saying... He's got missionary friends that give credible stories. I think he he believes his own people when they're saying it. He just doesn't believe ours. Right. Right. Yeah. Like that's the thing. Like Well, he says he says, Why did the Lord hide this gift away for over two thousand years? And I'm saying he didn't hide the gift away. Uh, the gift has been around. I will say that there is a diminishing of all gifts, not just tongues and prophecy and those things. There does seem to be a diminishing of gifts in the sense because of that whole laity piety thing of early Catholicism. So yeah. in general, but that doesn't okay, so mean those, those were the six statements. Here is the thesis statement. Okay. Could you have interpreters write down tongues and come up with the same interpretation? Well, I, I actually gave just gave an example. Yeah, we, we, <laughs> we did on that. And we would say, yes, yes, we have. Um, uh, as the gift of, would tongues, it be up to his standard? Maybe not. Probably not. No, he probably yeah. wouldn't like it as the gift of tongues uh, in acts is clearly a foreign language. Disagree with that premise. Uh, and it is difficult to make a biblical case that the gift uh, uh, of foreign languages has definitely ceased. Again, he says it's difficult because he knows people who do it. Uh, and Paul was not advocating for the speaking of ecstatic languages in 1 Corinthians 12, 14. Deny that premise because you didn't grapple with that at all. Um, you you assumed that that it had to be known languages. You never explained that it would be known languages. And there's probably a place that he does that. He probably like has a biblical reason and some kind of exegesis to say it has to be known languages rather than glossolalia. But I would appeal to glossolalia and xenolalia, known human languages, and glossolalia is called gibberish. I'm not comfortable calling any tongue speech gibberish, but I will say, is it possible that it is a language that the speaker doesn't know and is not known to anyone present? That's totally possible. Um, yeah. But again, he, he, I think he's making a mountain out of a molehill here. Uh, and then uh, his kind of fifth and final uh, thesis statement says, and as we have heard credible reports on the mission field of receiving of the gift of tongues to speak of foreign languages, we can reasonably conclude that while God may give some the ability to speak in foreign languages that can be understood by uh, a native or uh, one with the gift of interpretation, uh, Miller, get your cursor off there. I can't read it. Uh, there, there never was, nor should. <laughs> oh, no. What'd you do? I don't know. I, did I you delete it? What are you doing, I bro? If I did, I'm just going to press undo. Just watch. Oh, boom. There it goes. Back. There you go. Okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> 
This is the worst. <laughs> Working with a live document, Miller just like starts deleting stuff. <laughs> okay, can be understood uh, by a native uh, or one with the gift of interpretation. Uh, there never was, uh, there never was, nor should be a gift of ecstatic languages that doesn't edify the body. Uh, but again, I think that we disagree with every single part of his premise. One, that it has to be a known human language. Two, that it has to edify the body, meaning encourage the mind and strengthen theological doctrine. Uh, I think that you can grow in trust of God and and that be sufficient for edification, um, but that not be found of something outside of extra biblical writing. So in, in the in the Bible, well, Edge, it says... Go ahead. Sorry, and that, that it has to edify the body as opposed to an individual. Uh, if anything, Paul is saying he edifies himself by speaking in tongues. So I, again, it doesn't have to be the body as a whole. Although in a setting where there's believers and unbelievers present publicly, yes, it should have interpretation. Sorry, keep going, Josh. No, 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 that, that, that's it. Uh, I mean, I, I think we just disagree with his premise. And I don't think he's made his premise, though he asked good questions. Um, I think that he is, it, it is correct for both the cessationist and the continuationist to be asking questions. Why are we doing this like this? Um, you know, why are we gathering together and speaking in tongues in this massive group with no interpreter? That's a good question. Uh, there, there's a biblical mandate not to do that. I think that sometimes the problem that I have is people will come in and say, um, this is bad, therefore there is none. So it would be the equivalent of me saying that's a bad teaching, therefore there is no teaching. And it feels like, like what happens a lot of the times Todd's is... teaching on tongues, perhaps? There's, there's bad tongues, <laughs> therefore... There are no tongues or very, very little tongues. And I, I think, well, that's that's an overstatement. Just because someone's doing a, practicing a gift in an unbiblical and undecent, a disorderly way doesn't mean there are no tongues uh, in the same way that there were bad practices taking place in the church of Corinth. And Paul doesn't say these aren't spiritual gifts. He says, do these spiritual gifts the correct way. So I think that would be more edifying is to direct and instruct and to teach on these gifts rather than uh, encouraging people to walk away from them entirely because the current expression that they are seeing is not um, in line with biblical prescriptions. So, um, any any closing thoughts for you, Miller? And then, if we have time, I guess we could take questions in the in the chat. I don't see any yet. Yeah, we've got about ten minutes left. Let's just take a couple questions. Well, I mean, people are going to have to drop questions. I should have asked this about ten minutes ago when we knew that we were wrapping up. If well, you have questions or concerns about the gift of tongues, you want to drop them in there. Drop them into the comment section. Yeah, I remember seeing somebody put the in big bold question mark or questions. Um, let me make it funny. Uh, I see BJ Allen ask a question: Would God give someone a message uh, in tongues that require an interpretation to a body of believers where an interpreter isn't present? Hmm. I would say that probably not. I would say that if God's giving a tongue that's intended for the group, then there, then He would also provide the interpretation. Yep. Yeah, that's like saying, would God give a gift of sickness without there being? Or would God would God give the gift of healing if there's not a gift, if there's not a need, a need uh, sickness. for sickness to be healed? Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. 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 I agree. Um, I got another one for um. Ooh, I'm not going to try to pronounce that name. Yugaduk GT, bro. Come on. Okay. Um, uh, question. I think I think you may have uh covered this in a previous episode uh but does the interpretation necessarily have to follow the tongue since it's spiritual can't it come prior to the tongue what do you think uh i don't think so um i mean the whole point he's trying to make in first corinthians 12 is this idea that the gifts of the spirit make us one new man in christ so you may be a hand i may be an eye but we actually need one another and tongues and interpretation quite literally that's how that works they need one another uh, you need somebody to speak in tongues in order to have an interpretation. Um, because if you're saying you get an interpretation before the person ever speaks in tongues, I just wouldn't call it an interpretation. I would call it probably a, a prophetic word. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Uh, could it be, though, that someone gets a prophetic word and then someone stands up and gives in tongues and then an interpretation matches the prophetic word? Sure. That could have happened. Yeah, eventually. yeah totally. Yeah. Uh, Paul asked the question, uh, if Paul... Uh, so Paul's asking about Paul. If Paul said uh, that he thanked God that he spoke in tongues more than those he was addressing, is that to say that he did it both publicly and in private or just in private? Um, I don't know that we have any kind of indication that Paul ever gave yeah, a word definitive. publicly in, in tongues. Yeah, it seems to say that he definitely did it privately. 
Um, yep. But it doesn't necessarily say that he gave public words and tongues with interpreter. Although it wouldn't surprise me if he did. He was, half, you know, he was teaching on these things. He was praying for people. I long to see you that I might impart some spiritual gift. Or you know, he prayed for Timothy. He was imparted a gift that he encouraged him to use and stoke into a fire. And I would imagine that when it came to all of the gifts of the Spirit, Paul was probably encouraging them all and uh, participated just like everybody else did based on whatever gifts Paul was given. So it could be quite possible. And we know he spoke in tongues, right? So I would guess that, especially as he was teaching it, he probably did it. But again, nothing definitive in the text tells us one way or the other. It's good. Here's another one. Uh, when should I speak in tongues? Is it something that I should initiate or something I should be led to do in prayer? Sometimes in church they say, everyone speak in tongues now. Stop doing that. Stop doing that, yeah. that part right there. Everyone speak in tongues now. Yeah. Activate tongue powers. Don't do that. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, when I say now, I just think of Power Rangers. Anyway, um, I would encourage arms. you. Tongues. Yeah. Tongues, I choose you. No, okay. Uh, <laughs> I would say I would say no, don't do that. Um, I do speak in tongues in church all the time, but I do it often with a volume knob. Like tongues has a volume knob. So I pray like during worship all the time. I'll pray in English. No one can hear me because I'm speaking to the Lord. I'm speaking quietly under my breath um, because I'm not disrupting service. Um, and I'm doing the same thing uh, in tongues frequently. So I, I find that tongues is extremely useful when I don't have words to pray. When I wake up in the morning, my brain's not working. I'm super tired. When I'm really stressed out and something's like really weighing on me, like a uh, uh, an illness in the family or some horrible evil injustice that has taken place uh, in my proximity or around me with a loved one, uh, I often find that I'm out of human words. And I'm like, Lord, like it's a spiritual groan, if you will. Like I, I got nothing. Like I will pray the words in English. I might got two sentences out, but like I'm kind of done. My, I'm at my limit of mental capacity to do this. So I begin to speak in tongues because I know that I need to be praying in that moment. And depending on the power and the presence of the spirit in that moment but i don't know what to say and the gift of tongues is extremely useful when you don't know what to say uh so yeah initiate when you're out of words you got any yeah. any thoughts on that uh yeah i think the other question is probably have to do should i ever speak in tongues and initiate that in a public setting uh mm. i would say anytime you're in a public setting church setting there are elders that are running the church and I would submit anything that's to be done in a public manner to those elders who are overseeing the conducting of that church. Now, uh, there are occasions in my church where I have made room for this, where I said, hey, does anybody feel like God has given them uh, a word in tongues? And does anybody feel like they would be down to interpret? If so, let's all pray and let's see what happens. And so I've had people speak in tongues and interpretation happen. I don't do that every week, uh, but but we let all kinds of gifts operate on a weekly basis uh, based on the situation and based on what God is giving. And the same thing within home groups. I encourage all of these things to be practiced. That's it. Yeah. This next question I think is interesting because it, it gets on to the subject of uh, what we call residential gifts or occasional gifts. Uh, this question is, in your experience, do you find that the tongue speakers has the gift ongoing or occasionally or one and done sort of situation? I, I know of people who have given a word in tongues, only one. Uh, and have never done it since or before. Um, I do too. But the vast majority of people that I know who speak in tongues continue to speak in tongues. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't have a great answer for that. Um, it does appear that at times there are these things called residential gift, like pastoring, teaching. It does seem to be something that's there and doesn't go away. Uh, but then, as I mentioned earlier in the show, the gift of healing, Paul doesn't seem to be able to use that on command. Uh, the gift of prophecy would be another one. Like, I don't think you can just get up and decide to prophesy. I think the Spirit has to lead you to do that. You can't You can't just have dreams and visions on command. It's not how things work in the Bible. These Peter falls into a trance or, you know, someone's asleep and as they're asleep, God speaks to them in a dream. So, like, uh, I don't know that we have biblical categories of Scripture that say these are residential and these are occasional. However, um, so those categories aren't biblical. Those are Josh Lewis categories, and I'm trying to make sense of some of these texts. Uh, as as I have experienced interpretation, and that's the thing, the Bible doesn't describe what interpretation of tongues looks like. It doesn't. So I don't really know how all of that works. Um, my best understanding we don't know, and approximation... know, scripturally speaking. Correct. We know yeah, anecdotally. So, anecdotally, that's right. So, so I'm trying to approximate between experience in the same way that you would do for anything. Like, what's a word of knowledge? There's not ever a story in the Bible where word of knowledge is described. Now, some people go, well, what about the woman at the issue? You know, the woman at the cot of the, uh, at the well, you know, and Jesus goes out to her and, you know, he tells her all this stuff about her. It's like, yeah, but you've already taken a definition and imposed it on the text. That text never says the words word of knowledge. Could that right. be prophecy? We don't know. 
Um, the Bible doesn't describe it in great detail of what is happening in that moment. So um, there are gifts like word of knowledge, word of wisdom, interpretation of tongues. Like we don't see that spiritual gift being exercised. What we see is a known human language being communicated to a person of that geographical region that speaks that known language. We don't see the spiritual gift at being exercised. So I don't, I don't know if it's residential or, or occasional. Um, so I don't know if that's helpful or harmful. Would you have anything you want to add to that, Miller? No, no, it was good. Okay. I think we're at the uh, the hour mark. So Vandabha. hey, you guys, don't forget to uh, sign up for the Remnant Radio Conference. Josh, how many people do we have signed up so far? Do it. Over 200, man. Over 200 going to this conference. There's a and link in the description. Are Go we maxed out, out at the, 600 uh, or are there spots within that that are reserved only, for Bridgeway only or our 600. churches? Or... Yeah, only 600 okay, people only getting 600. in. Okay. So when it's done, it's done. In, in times past, we did a conference and we filled it up and then we moved to a different location and then we... Moved, filled that up and moved it to another location. We won't be moving. We will not be one. moving. So it's it's 600. That's the cap. Sign up while you can. Uh, links can be found basically everywhere. They're on the website, remnantradio.com. Remnant Conferences is the website where you register. Uh, but lots of great stuff. We have a ton of speakers coming in from all over the nation, I suppose. Um, They're going to be doing breakout sessions. Uh, we, Michael, Michael, and myself are going to be doing the evening sessions. We're all gathered together, but we're going to break you up. Uh, you can pick which class you want to go to if you want to do the uh, how to test a prophetic word or, you know, uh, Peter's view of prophecy in the second temple and like all kinds of fantastic, like conversations and breakout sessions that'll be taking place. Where we can kind of equip and train you in the gift of prophecy as Todd Friel. I'm sure it gets really triggered at the end of that video as I'm talking about it. Uh, but no, it seems like a lot of pastors are signing up too, right, Josh? Uh, yeah, man. Last time we did a conference, I think most of them are pastors, but, uh, but we only, so on our, I don't collect any info other than we have a pastor session. Do you want to sign up for the pastor session? This is only for pastors. Oh, and because so when that, they register for do. that, that's the only way that we know that they're pastors. Um, it, because it was a prophetic conference, you know, Jeff, who's helping us set it up, was like, "Hey, like, let's let's get all their address and all their info." And I was like, "No, let's not do that. Let's just go ahead no. and take their payment and like not collect yeah, any yeah. information yeah. on these people." Because, <laughs> because, uh, yeah, 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 yeah that, that could come that with some badly. Accusation. Yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah. That's right. So we tried to we tried to Smart. Uh, kind of use a uh, what do you call it honor system. You know, if you're going to go to that pastor session, you know, other pastors are going to ask you where you pastor. So don't lie about it. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> that kind of thing. Anyway, uh, yeah, we're not personally uh, holding them accountable. To, yeah, yeah, to it'll, it'll be a live correction. Oh, so it'll, it'll take place. Anyway, <laughs> uh, guys, thank you so much for tuning into this episode of Remnant Radio. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. We'll have Michael Roundtree back on next week as he'll be getting back from vacation. I will probably be on vacation, though, so you probably won't yeah. see me next week. Uh, but you guys are going to have fun doing a bunch of good interviews. So, where, where uh, are you blessings. going, Josh? Uh, it's a family vacation, so I'm going with my family down to the, uh, not the Dells, that's in Wisconsin. What's the one in Texas, the big water park? Schlitterbond. Texas? Schlitterbond. Oh, like San Antonio? Yeah, 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 yeah. Isn't that San Antonio? Yep, I think so. Yeah. That's a I, drive, bro. It's six hours from here. It's not too bad. That's six hours too much. Yeah. It's getting hotter too. It is. That's good thing it's a water park. <laughs> good thing I've got short hair. Yeah. <laughs> Guys, blessings. Thank you much. We'll see you next time. Monday. See you Monday. <laughs>